Uh, I'm David Glazer, and I'm just here quickly to do some introductions before turning over to uh, Teresa Thompson and David Waits. So very few announcements, just our, our typical ones. So first, people don't always realize this is recorded. And so if you need to leave in the middle, um, if it runs long, if for whatever reason, you've got a friend who you think should hear it, you can send them the recording when you get uh, at the end, at the end, you will get a copy of the recording along with the evaluation, and you can listen to it, forward it to friends. You can also listen to it on our website. Um, if you're looking for the handouts, those have already been sent to you, so just look in the email. If you're having a hard time finding that, look in the email. There's a link to the handouts. Next month's webinar, which is going to be 12-12, and for those of you at Central Time, 12 p.m., so the 12-12-12 webinar is going to be the grab bag regulatory issues for 2019. The new physician fee schedule, including the big evaluation and management coding changes. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the inpatient perspective payments changes. Um, this is kind of a biggie. This in the part of the support act, which was a bill focused on opioid treatment, they extended or created a new anti-kickback provision that applies to all payers. It's Largely treatment related, but this is a little crazy. All laboratory services for all payers are now subject to a kickback act. We'll talk about that on 12-12. Um, uh, finally, I just want to mention, as people are talking about budgets right now, both the employment law group and the health law group are happy to try sort of fixed fee advice approaches to things. We've been doing this with some health lawyers. We mentioned it last month, where We'll say for X per month, we'll answer your health law questions and we'll try it and see if it works and if it works for you and works for us. Um, I know the employment folks have had success with this as well. And one of the reasons this works well for us is that we tend to be fond of the short answer. One of the reasons I love both Teresa and David is that they are practical and terse, unlike what I am doing right now. Uh, and so they will give you really good, quick answers to things. So without further ado, I believe we're going to start with Mr. Waits. So uh, from one David to another, uh, Teresa and David, thank you for joining us. Thanks, David. Teresa and I are both employment lawyers, and today's presentation is Me Too and You, Sexual Harassment in the Workplace in 2018. I think it's obvious. Sexual harassment is a hot button issue in the employment context for employers in all industries. But, and the healthcare uh, industry is obviously no exception. In fact, because of the unique setting that you find your industry, and we'll talk about some of those unique issues, um, I think unfortunately you may find yourself having to address the issues that we're gonna talk about today sooner rather than later. So the agenda for today is as follows. We're gonna give you an overview, some key themes and takeaways to think about when you're listening to this presentation. We're gonna talk about what hasn't changed in the environment for sexual harassment and inappropriate behavior, namely the law. We're gonna talk about the current environment, and then we're gonna talk about what this actually means for you. How can you be proactive to prevent sexual harassment and inappropriate behavior, and how can you respond if you get a complaint? Starting with the overview. This is a new world. We're gonna talk about what this means and how this issue has arisen, but it is a new world. And as part and parcel of that, where in the past perhaps legal defenses were things that we stood behind if we were implementing policies and training, legal defenses really can't be the focus. In fact, we need to take proactive action. So when we're talking about these issues today, think about being proactive and taking a preventative rather than a reactive approach. Similarly, Atmospheres that we may have tolerated in the past, like a boys club atmosphere, which you may see in some healthcare industries, whether we like it or not, we just can't tolerate it anymore. It cannot continue. As part of this new world, employees have new expectations. These employees are gonna have the expectation that when they raise a concern or where there, where there is an issue, you are gonna take, take not only a proactive approach, but a rapid approach to respond. You are going to investigate, you're gonna do it thoroughly, and you are gonna take action. So when we're thinking about all these issues, what we want to do today is get you ready to act. I wanna talk about what hasn't changed. We're gonna talk about publicity and the new world and how we respond to that, but what hasn't actually changed is the legal underpinning 
the actual substantive law behind sexual harassment. Both federal and state law prohibits discrimination based on protected classes. And those protected classes, we've listed some of them on uh, this slide, they include sex. And in fact, sexual harassment is just a subset of sex discrimination. But there's other protected classes under state and federal law, and we've listed some here. Um, and when you're thinking about reacting or preventing inappropriate behavior, it's just, and the themes and the lessons we're gonna talk about today, it's not just about sex discrimination. We can apply this to all racial discrimination or uh, all discrimination rather based on protected class. So the law itself hasn't really changed. We still have these laws in place that we had last year and years before. As I said earlier, sex discrimination is really a subset, or sexual harassment rather, is really a subset of sex discrimination. We have two main types. First type is quid pro quo harassment. That's Latin for this for that. It's that scenario where somebody, usually in a position of power, uh, gives benefits or preferential treatment uh, in return for sexual favors or, or, um, or sexual conduct, or actually withdraws or takes away certain benefits, privileges, um, because of a, um, perhaps if somebody's rebuffed. But when we think about quid pro quo harassment, it doesn't necessarily have to be the Harvey Weinsteins of the world. It can be something a little bit more simpler. Um, you have a scenario where, say, a, um, a, a physician uh, in the operating room likes to tell inappropriate sexual jokes, and people feel like they have to laugh at his jokes, his or her jokes, and, um, and tolerate that behavior. Otherwise, they'll be retaliated against or they won't be able to rise. So that can be an example of quid pro quo harassment. It's a little bit less common than the second type of sexual harassment, and that's hostile work environment harassment. Uh, and I'll just read the definition. It's unwelcome sexual conduct that is severe or pervasive and unreasonably interferes with an individual's work performance or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. And I want to focus on two key aspects of that definition. The first is Sexual conduct has to be unwelcome. Now, I think there's a sort of mis, um, misinterpretation of what welcomeness means. Uh, welcomeness is not the same as consent. Welcomeness is different, and I can illustrate it with a scenario. Say a physician, and I don't mean to pick on physicians, I'm married to one, but say a physician uh, has a sexual relationship with a um, with a medical assistant and the relationship goes on for several months and the doctor and the medical assistant go to a hotel after after work and they have sex. Um, the relationship ends and at some point the medical assistant is terminated for poor attendance. And the medical assistant comes back and says, no, I wasn't terminated for poor attendance. I was actually terminated because I, um, because I had this sexual relationship and it was sexual harassment. And the doctor's defense goes as follows. Well, um, this wasn't sexual harassment. Um, this particular medical assistant, she went to the hotel with me. I didn't have to drag her. It wasn't sexual assault. She consented. That's not going to work. That's consent. That's not welcomeness. Because the medical assistant can say, well, yes, I did at first go along and I consented, but I didn't want to. I felt like I had to. It was no longer welcome, even though I consented. So think about that welcomeness versus consent distinction. And then I also want to talk about severe or pervasive. It doesn't have to be severe and pervasive to be a, a hostile work environment. And the pervasive aspect is sometimes harder for us to react to or to prevent. Think about an RN who's, um, you know, who is called by an administrator, sweetie or dear or honey. You know, perhaps that's obnoxious and inappropriate and not what we want to see, but it's not severe. But what if that same RN, when she was called sweetie or dear or honey, was with a patient who made a lewd comment about her body? And what if that same RN was part of a group of RNs who like to share inappropriate jokes and sexual pictures? So while all three of those things aren't necessarily severe as we think of them under the law, they could be pervasive. Another thing to think about when we're talking about a hostile work environment, intent is not required. We often hear, I didn't mean to offend anyone. It was just a joke. That's not necessarily going to work. 
So what's some behavior that's gonna get you into trouble and gonna implicate these sexual harassment and discrimination laws? Obviously teasing, unwelcome solicitation, staring, invading personal space, invading, invading privacy. On to more serious concerns, like touching, suggestive behavior, and sending sexually graphic pictures and materials. And all this can be conducted via text messages, e email, or on social media. Uh, social media and text messages seem to get people into trouble all the time. And both Teresa and I have had cases involving uh, sexually explicit text messages or the sharing of pictures. And again, we can think about welcomeness being a part of this defense where certainly somebody may be consenting to sending pictures of themselves, but it wasn't because they wanted to. I wanted to jump in, David, just to add that um, while we've been focusing and really we think about the text messages, the electronics, the emails, you know, social media, you can't forget about those inappropriate interactions at work that start with your example of the nurses liking to uh, talk about uh, their sex lives or those sorts of things that suddenly get a little bit out of hand. And those things are happening every single day in every single workplace. And at some point, somebody's going to think about that as being unwelcome. And we're seeing a lot more of those recently than we used to. Absolutely right. And later on in the presentation, we'll talk about how we can implement training or outreach that helps eliminate or alleviate those cultural concerns, that behavior that we used to tolerate in the past, but we just don't do it anymore. From a legal perspective, your obligation as employers is if you knew or should have known of the harassment, you need to investigate and timely, take timely and appropriate action. And also in the event that a, uh, a manager or a supervisory employee engages in the harassment and it leads to an adverse employment action, there's the potential for strict liability, which means you have no defense. It happened, you're just arguing about damages. It's a really bad place to be in. So we've set out the laws and sort of troubling behavior or behavior that could implicate those laws. But it's also important to think about the parameters of sexual harassment from a legal perspective. It can be any individual toward any individual. It doesn't need to be an employee that causes the behavior, causes that hostile work environment. It could be a vendor. It could be a customer. It could be one of your patients. It can be a man against a woman, a woman against a man, a woman against a woman, and a man against a man. It does not matter. As long as it really meets that legal definition, you could be potentially liable. Before you move from this slide, David, though, I really wondered in the healthcare industry what the statistics really show as to who is bringing claims and uh, found a study that showed that the majority, the overwhelming majority of complaints in the healthcare industry relating to sexual harassment are women against men. And the studies show that the reason for that is that um, the large percentage of those in leadership in healthcare are men, but they're, the vast majority of the workforce are women. Before we move on from our legal perspective, I want to talk about a law that sort of dovetails that we see often in tandem with discrimination slash harassment claims, and that's retaliation. Retaliation is exactly what it sounds like. It's where somebody's job status or environment's negatively affected because the employee has complained about harassment or discrimination, participated in an investigation, or filed a charge of loss, a charge or lawsuit. And so you would often see folks saying, I was terminated or demoted or given a poor performance review, denied work opportunities because I complained about harassment. And it's really important to know that you as an employer can potentially be liable for retaliation even if the underlying complaint had no merit. So, so if somebody complains about sexual harassment, you do a good investigation, and you find that there was no harassment, you still need to be aware and be wary of not retaliating against this individual for bringing forth that good faith complaint. So we've talked about the law. And the law actually sets a really high bar to prove sexual harassment. There's lots of cases out there that say, this isn't sexual harassment, and that isn't sexual harassment. It's a really high legal bar. But only a court and only a jury can be the ones that decide this was harassment or this wasn't harassment. And you don't even want to be in that situation. Your focus and our focus should be on preventing all inappropriate behavior, 
not just conduct you can be liable for. And so as we move away from uh, the basics of sexual harassment and the underlying laws that relate to them, the real question is, why are we revisiting all of this now? We all thought, at least those of us in the law, that we had been doing a pretty decent job of dealing with sexual harassment. Sexual harassment claims were down. We felt like, wow, we really managed this. We did the right thing. And then all of a sudden, the media explosion. It all happened. We were hearing about it in every single industry. Hollywood was the first, went on to TV personalities, then it was CEOs, now it's coaches and writers, judges. Nobody is immune and no industry is immune. I ran a search just to find out what was happening in the healthcare industry. And I found headlines like sexual harassment in healthcare, it's hashtag you too or hashtag me too in medicine, women harassed in hospitals and operating uh, rooms await reckoning. These are the sort of things that you're dealing with. And then as we see all of the media, it goes viral. And all of this explodes on social media, in the regular media. You can't turn on the news in the morning without hearing about it. And it isn't just one generation. This is there are women and men coming out across all generations saying, this didn't go away. You all thought you were doing such a great job, but you're not. It, it's not just one generation, it's just not one culture, and now it's gone international as well. And the impact really is on the focus of where does this go? I found one article that showed a $168 million judgment against a California hospital arising from a personal assistance uh, sexual harassment claim against some of the surgeons. And it all related to that talk David referenced in the uh, surgery rooms and in the break rooms and some really, really terrible conduct still happening that really hadn't been talked about before. And what does this really tell us? What it tells us is that there is a changing perception. This idea that we had done everything right and that we had managed sexual harassment in the workplace was wrong. In 2011, 47% of Americans actually thought that sexual harassment was a serious problem. But that's, you know, a large number, but not over 50%. You get to 2018, and 82% now believe that sexual harassment is a problem, and 72% believe that it is a serious problem. So it shows a few things. It shows that people are now coming forward where we really thought that we had managed something, and it's placed sexual harassment in the spotlight. But it's a different spotlight. So we're addressing social uh, sexual harassment in a different way. People are talking about this, not just coming to HR and saying, gee, I feel like I've been sexually harassed, but rather there is a discourse about this. People are talking about it with their friends, with their families, with their coworkers. It has become a much broader topic than we have ever seen before. And women and men are speaking up. And the focus that we are seeing is on accountability and change. People are looking for action. And why are they looking for action? It's because in this new environment, people have this heightened sense of awareness. There's a heightened sensitivity to bad behavior. This idea that the good old boys club is okay, it's not okay. And people are coming forward to say it's not okay. And they're asking people to act. And I think what we're seeing is that conduct that employees may have tolerated in the past is no longer acceptable. And they're saying it is no longer acceptable. Part of that is because there's an awareness of additional legal rights. But I think more it is that employees have been empowered by the Me Too movement to exercise those legal rights. And so we are seeing action where in the past several years, we weren't seeing action. And the other piece that we think is interesting in this new environment is that employees and their attorneys, and that's key, are no longer worried about whether they can meet the legal thresholds. That is, can they prove that it is severe or, per or pervasive? Can they prove that it was unwelcome? At some level, they don't care. 
They're not as concerned about those legal thresholds, and we'll talk about that a bit. So let's dig into this increased awareness and sensitivity just a little bit. So first, the idea that there is increased awareness and sensitivity is not just focused on sexual harassment, at least what we thought about as sexual harassment. It has really expanded to demonstrate that employees are much less tolerant now to other behaviors, whether it's rude behavior, whether it is a physician, and again, we don't intend to abuse the physicians here, we'll call it the executive instead. Maybe it's the executive of the hospital who consistently treats uh, his or her subordinates in a really rude and obnoxious way. Maybe that behavior actually rises to the level of verbal abuse. There doesn't have to be any physical abuse. Maybe it's just everyday verbal abuse. Maybe that conduct rises to the level of bullying. Maybe it doesn't. Not, maybe it doesn't. But those are the behaviors that people are focusing on. It doesn't need to be sexual harassment to come into the spotlight. It's unprofessional conduct, and employees are asking people to take action. And it's not just acts of sexual harassment, bullying, or behavior. What we're seeing is that this increased awareness is also focusing on other traditional areas of dis discriminatory discriminatory acts. And that could be whether or not uh, a nurse is thinking that they're properly advancing throughout the organization. They might be asking, am I, be, am I really being given the same work opportunities as my male counterparts? Am I being paid fairly? All of these questions are being wrapped into the Me Too movement and the discussions in the public discourse regarding these issues is increasing. And employers need to be thinking about how are we going to address all of this and who does it impact? When we look at who is receiving this increased scrutiny, who are the individuals being named as the offenders, there's really a broad range. But in the healthcare industry and in other industries, we're really looking at those people in power, those people who are in leadership positions. We're looking at your senior leaders, your boards, your surgeons, and even your patients. So in healthcare, you've got a big issue with regard to patients bringing concerns. And David's got a question here. In fact, we have a question from somebody. If a patient is harassing a medical professional, how do you balance the duty not to abandon the patient with the duty to protect the professional? The answer is very carefully. Um, you are... It, it, of course, is going to depend on the circumstances surrounding the patient. If it's an emergent situation where the patient's being wheeled into the operating room, obviously you can't abandon the patient at that point. And so you really need to think about what type of care you're giving the patient, whether they have alternate options. I've dealt with this issue before. And in this particular instance, the patient was in a non-emergent situation. They had other caregivers they could go to in the area. And what we advised the client to to do is to be aware of this um, prohibition on, on patient abandonment, abandonment, but to have a conversation with this patient and to, to explain to this patient that this behavior is unacceptable. And they worked with the medical professional to make it clear that they are having this conversation with the patient to let them know, we are telling this patient the behavior is unacceptable. And in this situation, the patient couldn't get their act together. It wasn't sexual harassment, but they were engaging in inappropriate behavior. They had other options and they were told respectively that they needed to leave and these were other options where they could seek similar care. So what is the practical effect of the new environment and this increased scrutiny that we've been talking about? What we've really been seeing is that you should expect that as you are dealing with how best to address sexual harassment, as you implement some of the recommendations that we're gonna be making for you today, employees are going to feel like they can come forward and maybe in situations where they felt like they couldn't before. Maybe they felt they would be retaliated against, but now they feel they have the ability to come forward. That is going to cause an increase in your internal complaints and we're already seeing that. The other piece that we are seeing and we're hearing this from plaintiff's lawyers is that more employees are seeking legal advice. 
What does that mean? What it means is that somebody is in the workplace and they're feeling like they're, they are being abused. They're subject to behavior that they find objectionable. They're going to go and seek legal advice or they're going to talk to somebody, one of their friends, one of their family members, and that person is going to say, go seek legal advice. This is going to happen more frequently and it's going to be earlier in the process. What we hear and what we're certainly seeing in our practice is that as those employees go seek legal advice, we are seeing higher demands. What do we mean by that? It means when that demand letter that you're going to receive at some time in the future, or maybe have already received, those demands are going to be higher. Um, the attorneys and the employees are calling for money to help them get through what it is that they claim is not appropriate. And they're not gonna go away for what we used to call nominal offers to settle. We are seeing some increase in agency activity as well, um, but it really hasn't yet reached the point of seeing a lot of additional litigation. And what David and I both think is that that's because we're seeing more settlements. And we're seeing more settlements because many of you as employers are saying, we don't want this to reach the public eye and we'd rather resolve the case earlier than deal with the public relations nightmare. What else are we seeing? We're seeing back to this idea that the legal thresholds are not a barrier. We used to just look at cases and say, well, uh, the statute of limitations is one year, for example. This happened three years ago, no worries. Uh, they can't bring claims, so therefore you don't need to worry about it. We can't really use that as a defense anymore. The mere fact that something, the mere fact that an employee may not be able to bring a claim based upon a prior act may not be a reason to just disregard your obligations to address the concern. You're going to hear about complaints about former employees to this same point. Somebody may come to you and say, this happened three years ago, but I want you to tell me what you're going to do about it. Those are really hard situations. And you as a company are going to have to be thinking about what do we do when it's a former employee? Are there ongoing obligations? Do we need to reach out to this former employee? Are, is there any continuing harm here? But these are things you're going to continue to see. Anonymous complaints or complaints are on social media are coming about more often. The anon anonymous complaints could be from somebody outside your organization. And we see these more often. It could be one of your employees assaulted me 20 years ago and they're putting you on notice. And now you're saying, what do I do? Have you received complaints? Um, is there any behavior that you should be concerned about? Or was this a one-off instance? What do you do about those things? It's likely that you're gonna see them. And what you're also going to see is what are you going to do about it? What is the focus? If an employee is bringing it forward, the concern is going to be to correct the issue. You're looking at it from the employee's standpoint, preventing the bad behavior. But from a company side, what you're really gonna be looking at as you address these claims is how do you mitigate the risk and how do you mitigate the PR that you've been seeing uh, throughout all of the various levels of media. And with this, how are you going to react to all of these new issues that you're seeing? And we're going to walk you through all of those now. So it's a scary environment in some aspects for an employer, as Teresa just laid out. And we can, before we talk about the way forward, we can talk about how we used to prepare in the past. How did we address these issues? Well, we had training, but the training may have been cookie cutter. It may have occurred once at the time of hire and may have been included along with a whole list of other things a new employee had to do. And we had a policy in our handbook and it was probably a pretty well-drafted policy, a nice policy. And it was given at the time of hire along with that other stack of information. And when we thought about sexual harassment and inappropriate behavior, maybe we focused a little bit on legal definitions. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that, but maybe that was, that was the focus. And we thought about these high thresholds that we talked about. The legal threshold for sexual harassment is extremely high. And as part of this, sometimes we have tolerance to the way things have always been. We tolerated a culture that looking back on, maybe we shouldn't have 
we caught slack where maybe we shouldn't have. Because we know when we think about these really well-meaning and well-intentioned uh, uh, mechanisms, we realize though that the policies we had, they were not read and the training perhaps it wasn't taken as seriously as we wanted it to. And really our training and our, our proactive approach wasn't designed for our specific work environment or for our industry. Because as, as I mentioned earlier, the healthcare industry has some really specific issues that you don't find elsewhere. I think chief in my mind is the patient issue. We already touched on one patient issue, but just as a matter of course, your practitioners, your professionals are gonna see these patients in a really sensitive setting. Uh, additionally, um, this isn't necessarily endemic to the healthcare industry, but there is a true hierarchical structure, especially among professionals, that we need to reflect on. And when I say hierarchical, that's just a fancy way for saying we've got doctors, we've got NPs, we've got nurses, we've got MAs, and they're all in sort of a pyramid in some form or fashion. So how do we meet the challenge? We have this well-intentioned approach, but the new world is here and we need to be more proactive and more thoughtful. Well, I think the best way of doing that is thinking about when we're revamping our training, when we're thinking about revamping our approach, we need to involve our senior management and involve our practice, practitioners in actually developing the type of content and the type of training and outreach that's gonna be effective for our specific industry. I said earlier, perhaps people did not take training seriously. I think when we think about our employment setting, we all can identify that one person that's the jokester in the office. They're the executive or they're that one doctor, maybe it's a surgeon, who always has a crack about, oh, they'll need to call human resources on me, who thinks training is funny, they think the examples are funny, or maybe it's just merely sensitive political correctness gone amok. I tell you what. That person is going to get themselves in a lot of trouble eventually, and they're going to get their employer, meaning you, in trouble too. And so that has to be the message to that jokester, to that person in senior management. And the message is, you don't take this seriously at your own peril. But perhaps by involving this person, telling them to take them seriously, and engaging them to actually help you in preparing the content you need to be proactive, you can avoid those issues and actually get them to take it seriously. Prior to the Me Too movement, the EEOC issued some guidance about uh, training, I believe, in sexual harassment, and they said something like this. This training is not stuff that's going to, it's not meant to change your mind, it's meant to help you keep your job. And I think that's well said. So when you're thinking about revamping or uh, addressing your sexual harassment training and policies in the new world, I'd recommend having team building sessions and meeting with people and really, and this can be done through surveys as well, but really trying to examine what the current state of affairs are. So you can identify those soft spots and those concerns and challenges in order to get a training or policy program that's gonna better be directed at the weaknesses or the issues with your culture or folks failure to meet your mission or folks um, um, inability to, or uh, um, those people who engage in inappropriate behavior that you want to sort of wipe out. And so you have these team building met, uh, meetings and you think critically about these issues so you're not putting your head in the sand. You're not trying to avoid those past issues. You're trying to uncover them so your training is better directed. And then after you have these sessions and you think critically, you can determine your goals and outline steps so that your training is really directed at addressing those soft spots. I talked about earlier um, how often training would occur once or once every several years. We'd strongly recommend if it's possible, it's, it's aspirational perhaps, but consider a program in the nature of an ongoing dialogue rather than just that one-off training. And have forums, have meetings of managers and team meetings and one-on-one -on -one check-ins. That's gonna be a lot more effective than just the one-off training that's buried in a stack of other documents. Ultimately, those people that Teresa identified as having a lot of scrutiny on them fell into leadership positions or maybe they're professionals. And so truly your corporation, your clinic, your hospital actually acts through those leaders, through those professionals. They can create liability for you and they can be your eyes and ears to help stem inappropriate behavior. So have a special focus on those managers 
and really uh, reward those managers, those professionals who are taking this seriously and working to address the challenges that you may face via inappropriate behavior and sexual harassment. And you can do so uh, in performance evaluations or in promotions and the like. One of the things David and I talked about as we were preparing is that when you actually focus on preventing bad behavior from the top down, it is much more effective across the organization. But if those at the top are not engaged in the messaging and the communication and the action toward preventing bad behavior, it will be much harder to implement company-wide. So when you're talking to management and you're thinking about implementing training for these managers, these supervisors, you really want to focus on how they can identify and eliminate these, quote, accidents waiting to happen. Train them to pick up on rude behavior or disruptive behavior or bullying behavior, even if it's not necessarily what we'd call sexual harassment or legal harassment. Train them and help them deal with really sensitive issues such as boundaries issues or even dating or budding romantic relationships. Uh, one of our colleagues, Bob Boiver, is often quoted as saying, as much as he'd like to eliminate all love from the workplace, <laughs> He's never been able to do that. And so we understand we're, we're lawyers, but we're sometimes practical people too. And we understand it's very difficult to eliminate romantic relationships completely from the workforce, but with proper training and a proper approach, you can really help eliminate the potential for lawsuits or for inappropriate behavior while understanding that not all relationships are going to be prevented. You can help your managers deal with problem patients. You can help them have conversations with the patients that I described where you're explaining uh, where inappropriate behavior may lead you to sever a relationship with a patient, how to deal with vendors, company-sponsored events, trade shows, business trips, after hours. These managers need to understand, and this should be a focus of any training uh, that you're implementing for these managers, that their job is not just nine to five. Sexual harassment and inappropriate behavior can happen at any time. And one thing to focus too on your uh, in your training is David listed on here the trade shows and the business trips. You would not believe the number of claims that we see coming out of uh, those types of sponsored events because when people are traveling, they tend to uh, relax. They might have a few cocktails, and your training should definitely include uh, awareness of how to act on those types of trips. So you've focused on your managers and you've implemented some, some new training modules, um, some new policies, and now you wanna also focus on your employees at large, of course. And as I said, uh, frequent touch points rather than annual training would be a best practice. It's not always going to happen, but it's something that you can aspire to. All employee meetings, team meetings, one-on-one -on -one check in and you'll think critically because you'll have met with people, key stakeholders, and even some employees at large. You'll have thought critically about the content of what this training and what you're trying to impart to these people. That training is gonna move beyond legal definitions. You're gonna make it clear to your employees that here's what the sexual harassment definition is, but we don't care. What we care about is preventing all inappropriate behavior, and we take it seriously. And so as part and parcel of that, you're gonna broaden your message and discuss into how you address the, the clinic's mission or the hospital's mission and how you address the culture. And by setting that mission and setting that culture and showing other employees how important it is to you can actually change those, those practices that maybe we had tolerance for in the past. I have seen it, I have actually, I absolutely seen it, including in the health industry where HR folks or other managers say, you know, we've got this problem with people doing inappropriate stuff. And, you know, through training and through, in some cases, corrective action, we've actually been able to clean things up and make it a better place for people to work. And while you're having these discussions and these meetings and these training sessions with these rank and file employees, we want to make sure you're not avoiding the tough topics. You're talking about rude behavior, disruptive behavior, you're bullying, you're teasing, all those issues that can create liability down the road. And you're also making it very clear to people what you should do when you witness inappropriate behavior. 
we have reporting mechanisms and most of our sexual harassment policies. But let's hammer home to these employees, to these employees. We take it seriously, and here is who you can talk to. So the big takeaway here is a more proactive approach in this new environment is going to be really focused on your culture, your mission. It's going to be multifaceted. Maybe it will occur more than once a year. You're not going to rely on a policy or a legal definition. Instead, you're going to really try and create culture shifts where necessary, or um, if things are going well, you're going to take steps to reinforce that good behavior. One thing to think about there too that we didn't really touch on in the training is to focus on retaliation as well and make sure that employees know that um, as part of your policy, as part of your um, reporting mechanisms, that they will not be retaliated against. I uh, can't tell you the number of times that an employee has come forward and said, I never raised this because I was certain I would be retaliated against or I was actually told by my supervisor or my physician that if you go to HR, you know what will happen. So make sure that you've got that as part of your training so that employees know they can come forward. Mm -hmm. And you may be thinking, okay, well, that's all well and good. You've told me what I want to focus on, but what should I actually be saying and how should I do it? So as a pitch, uh, Teresa and I do training, but there's so many other great resources, whether it's an attorney or an HR consultant that are providing training in your communities. So if you don't have the time or the bandwidth to do it internally, there are people can help. And if you don't engage us, that's totally fine. But think about when you're engaging other people, asking those questions, how are you gonna focus on my mission? How are you gonna focus on my industry? How are you gonna help me create a culture shift as opposed to just reciting what sexual harassment is or is not? So we've now walked you through the changing environment. We've walked you through the basics of uh, what sexual harassment is. We've talked about the additional behaviors that you need to be aware of. And we've given you some uh, really proactive steps that you can think about within your organization to better manage uh, these complaints that you will be receiving as uh, time goes on. So let's assume that you've done all of those things. But what happens when you do receive a complaint? Because you will receive a complaint. What should you really be thinking about? There are three key things that you're going to have to do that we're gonna walk you through. One, you have to be prepared to investigate. And we'll walk you through what we, we mean by that. You want to be able and ready and prepared to take action as needed whatever that action might need to be based upon a particular circumstance. And there are a number of different actions that might be necessary. And then afterwards, what you really wanna do is step back and reflect and say, what can we do better in the future? How can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? Because everything that we're talking about here today is about one, how do you remedy an ongoing problem that we actually thought we'd taken care of, but clearly we haven't. But in the end, how do we really make sure that we do it this time? And reflection on the complaints that you receive and what's happening in your workplace is gonna give you the ability to do that. So let's step into the investigation process. So why would you investigate? I thought this slide was interesting because it's the lawyer's perspective. We look at um, these particular situations and say, how do we manage risk? What are the defenses? I think you heard David say earlier, you can't focus on the defenses. But as lawyers, we can't help it, right? So we get a particular case and somebody comes to us and says, we've got this complaint, what should we do? Well, we automatically go to, let's evaluate the merits. Is this a real claim? Is this not a real claim? What do we do? What admissions have they made? Um, were they involved? What admissions have other people made? What, what are we focusing on here? Has the person being accused admitted that he or she engaged in the conduct? We want to look at whether or not the company has actually satisfied the law. Have they met the law or have, are, they, are they at risk? And really identify some soft spots. You know, we might be looking at how do we prevent this from getting bigger. So those all might be reasons to investigate. 
But why would a normal, what would a normal person say? Why would a normal person choose to do an investigation? If you look at it just from a really high level, you investigate because as an organization, you need to find out what happened. That's number one. You need to know what happened. Number two, an investigation helps you resolve the problem. If you don't investigate, if somebody doesn't come forward, if you don't dig into it, you can't resolve the problem. And if you go back to the legal part of this, you have an obligation to resolve and remedy the problem. A normal person might want to limit the, the workplace disruption. If you fail to investigate, your employees are going to talk about this. They're going to talk about it on social media. They're going to talk about it with one another. And it's going to cause a disruption in your workplace. Prompt investigation helps limit that disruption. It also helps meet the employee expectations. Why would you do it? Because the employee expects that you would, because your policy says that you would. That gets down to the final thing, which is because it's the right thing to do. If somebody comes forward, if you ignore their complaint, that is not the right thing to do. And frankly, that will lead to additional legal liability. So let's look at a little bit more into when to investigate. So we know that you must investigate when you've got a complaint, but when do you investigate? The hard part here is that you are going to become aware of misconduct in a lot of different ways. You might become aware of misconduct because you witnessed it. You might be seeing improper interactions in your everyday workforce. You might be seeing employees coming forward and just saying, hey, I saw this happen um, and I don't like it. I'd like you to do something about it. That might not rise to the level of an internal complaint or a grievance. It might not be a formal complaint, but you are now on notice of that. You might have an internal complaint process or a grievance process, and you might get either an anonymous or a direct complaint um, from somebody saying, this happened to me, I'd like you to do something about it. Or it might be something even more serious than that, which is you get a charge of discrimination from an agency, you get a demand letter from a lawyer. And the only thing that I'd caution is that if you are getting that contact from the agency or from a lawyer, think about whether or not you want to reach out to external resources, whether it's your legal counsel or otherwise, to make sure that you are addressing this in a way that might protect um, your investigation under attorney-client privilege, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But if you've got one of those more formal complaints, absolutely you want to investigate, but it might impact how you investigate. So let's look a little bit more into how those complaints come forward. We definitely can see uh, written complaints that are on a form that you might provide to your employees. You might get an email, you might get a text message. Um, we see more complaints coming forward in this manner or it might be a phone call from one of your employees coming to the supervisor saying, hey, this is happening to me. I'd like you to take some action here. It can come from a coworker. It can come from a supervisor. You might get a call from somebody's spouse saying this is happening to my, uh, my spouse and I'd like you to do something about it. We very often see sources of concern being raised in exit interviews. And that is not a reason not to do exit interviews, by the way. You want to know about the complaints, and employees often feel more free to speak in exit interviews than they otherwise would. Many companies have hotlines set up, and some employees use them, although I've always been surprised that the hotlines don't seem to be the main source of complaints. And maybe it's because people think it's anonymous or maybe they think people won't do, do anything about it. And again, it's not a reason not to have them. More options to provide the complaint is better than others. So these are direct complaints. What are some of the indirect complaints? These are the harder ones, again. These might just be offhand comments where someone says, oh, really, do I have to listen to that again? Man, I wish you would stop talking about his um, dating experience. Boy, I'd wish he'd stop talking about um, the sex he had last night. Those are pretty common things that you might hear. And if you hear them, it can cause you to need to investigate. You might also find out about 
some of these concerns on social media. As we all know, people feel much more free about speaking about anything on social media. And if they've been impacted, um, another employee might come in with a printout saying, hey, this employee is complaining about this interaction on social media. I think you need to do something about it because it impacts the workforce. So if you know when to investigate, you know what to look for and what type of complaints to think about, how do you define your successful investigation? What do you need to do? The first thing you really have to think about is making sure you have a clear scope. You want to investigate the complaint in front of you, but if during the course of the investigation that brings up other concerns, you don't want to ignore those. It might expand your scope, but always keep your scope in mind as you're going through your investigation. The second thing to really think about is who should be conducting the investigation. You really want to ensure that you've got an impartial and credible investigator, and what does that mean? It could be somebody inside your organization. It could be somebody in your HR team that is really good at digging into the facts and being able to stay on task, and who is viewed credibly by your employees. Or maybe you want to take an outside investigator. Maybe it's serious enough that you really feel you need an attorney or an HR consultant um, or somebody very skilled in workplace investigations to take it forward. This is a key decision that you need to make during the course of your, uh, at the beginning of your investigation. Who should conduct that investi investigation? And considering whether or not you need that to be under privilege, meaning that it is conducted under attorney-client privilege, um, that is something you should talk through. Oh, I went forward. You also want to make sure that as you are moving through, you are doing this promptly. If you go back to the legal standards, you must take prompt action to respond to a complaint. So you want to make sure that you set a timeline for your investigation. Investigations that tend to go on and on and on could create more problems as you go through. And what would you say in your view, Teresa, would be considered prompt? That's an interesting question. So if you received a direct complaint, for example, from an employee, I think you should be responding to that employee within the same day to say, we take your complaint seriously and we are going to take action. Now, you might not be able to complete your investigation in three days or a week, but you should be taking action in those first three days or the first week. David, any other thoughts on that? I would agree with that. Anecdotally, we've heard from plaintiff's attorneys that their clients, these aggrieved employees, um, really feel like they, they want things to move now and they get frustrated when things aren't happening today. Uh, plaintiff's attorneys, I don't think necessarily share their concern. So as long as it's not taking you know, a month, I think as long as you do what Teresa said, you respond almost immediately and start the investigation fairly quickly, as long as you're doing it uh, in a, and keeping the employee apprised of the status perhaps in some vague form or fashion, um, several weeks is not necessarily going to give me heartburn. I'd rather we do it thorough than do it quickly. And one other thing about that, to David's point about keeping the complainant advised as to the status, the worst thing you can do is leave that employee hanging out there thinking that nothing is being done because then the employee will will believe that nothing is being done and that only leads to bad things down the line. So the other thing that you need to think about is to really set out, you've defined your scope so you should already know what to do. Create your interview list. Know who it is that you need to talk to. Figure out who might have witnessed the potential conduct so that you can make credibility determinations as you go forward. Figure out what documents and data you need to think about. Um, one of our partners at our uh, recent all-day employment law seminar said, don't forget the text messages. There are almost always key information in those text messages, and don't forget to try to gather those. And then at the very end, make sure that you are very carefully documenting the results of your investigation. Create your interview notes and type them up if you can't read your handwriting, because if I wrote them out, you'd never be able to read them. Make sure that you have listed the documents that you considered and write out your conclusions. 
And I think when we think about successful investigations and such a serious issue, it can be very overwhelming. But at the end of the day, with a clear focus, you if you decide to do it internally, I, I can't tell you how many times I've received a call from a client, an HR professional usually, and they say, well, I didn't really do an investigation. I didn't hire anybody. I say, what did you do? And they said, well, I had interviewed the complainant, and then I interviewed the person they accused, and then I interviewed the witnesses, and I got the documents, and I took notes, and um, I'll send them to you now. And I said, guess what? You just did an investigation. Doesn't mean we're not going to go back and clean some things up or get some additional information, but your people can do it with the right training and with the right consultation uh, as far as privilege goes. So now that you've done your investigation, you've completed everything, you've got your careful documentation, what do you do then? The, one of the hardest parts of an investigation is to evaluate the credibility of the witnesses. Almost always, but not, I guess not always, sometimes you are going to have the accused admit to the, the conduct, and you might hear, I didn't think it was a big deal, but very often you will be evaluating the credibility of the complainant and the accused and those that have witnessed the conduct. And that is the first thing that you need to do. Determine who it is that you believe if it is a he said, she said situation. And you might say, I can't do that, but I feel like you almost always can based upon the information that you get. After you've done that, you really have to determine what are you going to do? We've listed that not all bad behavior is created equally, and that's true. This might be the very, just one instance, and it was an interaction that the employee found offensive that you can say, you know what, we agree, that was inappropriate, we've disciplined this person, um, we've remedied this, we're giving additional training, we're doing X, Y, and Z, does that satisfy you? And the employee might say, yes, so long as it doesn't happen again. But Nowadays, we have to say, more often than not, we hear employees say, we expect termination for bad behavior. And the bad behavior that they expect termination is not always the really egregious things that you're seeing online. And as you look forward, you can't help but think, based upon what action you are going to take, your response to this, if this is sued out, how will it look in litigation? Don't forget that piece. So this leads to the final thing about reflection. After your investigation, after you've decided what to do, think back, why did this happen? And what can you do to prevent it in the future? And just put that in the back of your mind to think about as you go forward. So what are the implications? I think it should be pretty clear with all we've talked about today. But your business reputation, and in some cases your personal reputation is at risk if you're not stamping out inappropriate behavior. These disputes are gonna play out in the traditional media as well as social media. It's gonna impact employees' productivity, their morale. You might see higher turnover. You might have difficulty recruiting people to your clinics, your hospitals, your businesses if you've got negative PR out there from some inappropriate behavior or sexual harassment. And that's also gonna impact your client and patient relationships too. From a more practical monetary standpoint, when we aren't able to prevent or remedy inappropriate behavior, we see agency charges. EEOC lawsuits are threatened lawsuits, and then sometimes settlements with employees and their counsel. Teresa reported earlier some settlements involving uh, the healthcare industry, and this is just a few examples outside the healthcare industry um, of recent settlements, and these are just the ones that were reported. We're talking about a lot of money here. So in closing, what's the new reality? The world is different and we don't expect it to change anytime soon. This discourse is expected to continue into the future. It is probably the new normal. We've got increased employee awareness and sensitivity and simply put, old habits will not suffice. Thank you all very much. Uh, we are going to be ending our presentation, but just a reminder that on 12-12 at 12 o'clock Central, there will be a 2019 regulatory update. 
and we hope you tune in. Thanks so much for joining us.